Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great event on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience, so if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use the question and the answer tab on your interface and submit your question, and we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also have two polling questions throughout the webinar, so hopefully we can get everybody engaged with those. And we have a very public chat interface there, so we encourage your conversations during the webinar. So if you have a question, a uh, suggestion, a comment, anything you want to send over to us, please feel free to do that. We will we'll chat you back. And also, at the end of today's webinar, we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Managing Permissions, Core of Zero Trust in the Cloud. Our speaker today is Nicholas Barrett, or Beretta, I'm sorry, who is the uh, Principal Solutions Architect at CloudNox. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Charlene. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to, to chat today. Excellent. Well, I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, let you get into your presentation, and I'll cut, take myself off mute when we get to that first polling question. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone's hearing me okay, right, Charlene? I'm guessing I'm coming through okay? You're great. It's awesome. All right. Awesome. So, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Nicholas. I am, as Charlene said, the principal SA at CloudNox. Uh, CloudNox is a platform that enables customers to fundamentally change the way they manage permissions in their cloud environment. That includes identifying over-granted, unused, high-risk permissions in the environment, taking those permissions away, and then building mechanisms and guardrails for end users and developers to quickly gain the access they need uh, in a way that's, that's congruent with zero trust and least privilege without slowing down developers and slowing down the pace of innovation uh, that the company is pursuing by moving to cloud in the first place. So the agenda for today's talk is gonna cover a couple of different areas. We're going to talk a bit about the current state of cloud security. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the existing challenges with cloud permissions engineering. Uh, and we're gonna open up a couple of polling questions to get the audience's view uh, on this take. Um, I'm going to talk about how a complete CIEM or Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management, that's the name of the category that Gartner has given to uh, platforms like CloudNox. We're going to talk about how a complete CIEM helps solve the process problem. I'm going to walk through some example use cases and demos of how customers are using CloudNox uh, to drive that process change and move to that zero trust data-driven least privilege access model in the cloud. And then we're gonna wrap up and have some time for Q&A. So plenty of opportunity to get engaged. I will endeavor to leave plenty of time for Q&A and answer as many questions as possible. Uh, and, I, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you for letting me talk to you. So getting started with the current state of cloud security. Um, so as adoption in cloud has, has grown over the past couple of years, um, you know, whole alliances and whole lenses have been put on what are the top threats in cloud environments today from a security perspective? So the CSA, the Cloud Security Alliance, put out a case study uh, where they called their egregious 11, the top threats to cloud computing. Uh, they called these out and among the top threats, it's kind of hard to read that eye chart there, but among the top threats are the uh, over permissioning in the environment. So over granted permissions, identities that have way more permissions than they actually need to access different APIs and resources in the cloud environment, as well as configuration management issues, uh, you know, an issue configuring an instance or a firewall rule or a bucket policy. So those are two of the top 11 threats that the CSA has called out. Now, how does this tie in today? If you look at the landscape of cloud security, we're, we're pretty good at configuration management. We're not perfect at it, 
um, but we're pretty good at managing configuration of resources and making sure that resources have the right tags, that they have the right configuration, that they have the right security group rules or the right firewall rules. So we're pretty good and we're getting better at doing that half of the equation. On the other side of it, um, the identity and access approach um, and making sure that identities have exactly the permissions that they need, that they get those permissions quickly and that they have no more permissions than what they need to do their job or serve their function. That's where the challenge comes into play. So it's at this point here, I'm gonna actually ask Charlene to open up our first poll question. Charlene, if you wanna take it away. Absolutely. First polling question is going out. The question is, has your organization experienced a cloud breach in the past two years? You can choose from yes, no, or I don't know. The polling question is located in the poll uh, section there on your interface. So go ahead and make your choice. I'm gonna leave this polling question open up, uh, open for a little bit, uh, Nicholas, and then we can uh, maybe circle back and take a look at the results in a bit. All right, absolutely. Yeah, we'll take a look in, a, in just a couple of minutes here. But if you wanna go ahead and answer that poll question, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, some breaches that have happened over the past few years. And if you look at the cloud breaches that have happened over the past two, three, four years, and even beyond, there's really two broad patterns that emerge in terms of, I'd say the vast majority of breaches suffer from the same two sets of root causes. The first one is a data breach because data was put in something like an S3 bucket or a cloud storage bucket or an Azure blob that was made accessible to the internet when it shouldn't have been. So those are kind of like the anonymous access breaches. Um, so that's one avenue by which companies have experienced breaches over the past few years. And the cloud providers have taken steps to solve that. So if you've worked on AWS, you've ever tried to make an AWS S3 bucket public, you get a lot of kind of scary looking warnings and things that get in your way before you can do that. So they've taken steps to kind of make that harder and call out that that's not the default behavior. Um, the other side of it, the other main cause of breaches is an attacker gaining access to an over permissioned identity. And they could gain access a number of different ways. Here's two examples that I'm just gonna go through on the slide quickly. So this is a recent attack chain for a breach that happened last year. This was a major financial services customer, a thought leader in cloud security, actually a thought leader on the configuration side of managing cloud resources. They've actually been heavy contributors to a really popular and, and really, really valuable cloud security configuration management tool. But this attack chain, so we had a, an attacker who was able to gain access to an AWS EC2 instance via a misconfigured firewall. And once they were in that instance, that instance had a role attached to it, an instance role, basically credentials that are assigned to the instance. If you're not familiar with AWS, credentials that are assigned to the instance that give it access to uh, cloud APIs in AWS. So it's roughly analogous to an Azure app or a Google Cloud service account. Um, so because the attacker was on the instance, they were able to query the instance metadata server, which happily handed over the credentials for this role without any further challenge. This role actually granted access to every S3 bucket in the organization. And so moving laterally with these credentials, the attacker was eventually able to find a bucket uh, that had over 100 million customer records in it, and they were able to exfiltrate that data out of the environment. Uh, this attack ultimately opened up because of a misconfigured firewall, but what made it into something that ended up on the front page of the news and a breach of customer data was the fact that this identity on this instance was over permission. If this identity didn't have access to these buckets, the vast majority of which it was never using, never had a, a use case to even look at or touch, this attack wouldn't have reached this scale. So that was one example. Uh, this was another example. And by the way, these are patterns. So that you, know, you might know which organizations I'm talking about, I'm talking through this. The point here isn't to say, you know, they did it wrong. It's these patterns exist and these are pretty common patterns because of a common problem that most cloud customers are facing, regardless of if they're AWS, Google Cloud, Azure. I worked as an AWS SA for two years. I worked as a Google Cloud customer engineer for two years. I saw this pretty consistently, this model that we're gonna talk about across all of them. So this second pattern, also in AWS, so the attacker, again, gained access to an instance. This time they found access keys, so basically API keys that allowed programmatic access to the AWS API stored on the instance. They were able to use that API key to access database snapshots in uh, AWS's relational database service, RDS. They were able to create a new dummy database from that snapshot, and that database happened to contain user accounts, password hashes, certificates, private keys, 
Now, the, the vendor that suffered this breach was actually a cloud security firewall vendor. And so the compromise of these private keys basically compromised uh, the, the environments, the cloud firewall environments of 13,000 of their customers. So this was also a pretty bad breach that was perpetuated by two things. One, this access key was stored on this instance in a non-secure manner. And second was this API key was associated with an IAM user that had way more permissions than they actually needed for the function that this app was using that key for. So with that being said, I'm actually gonna pause for a second and ask Charlene, if you could tell us a bit about the poll results that we got, if we got yeah. any engagement for yeah, we got some interesting poll results. The question was, has your organization experienced a cloud breach over the past two years? 20% said yes. We had 47% who said no, and 33% who said they don't know. So um, that, you know, it, it shows that uh, cloud breaches are happening, definitely. Yeah, so it's really interesting and pretty in line with what I expected to see. So despite the fact that, you know, this is a pretty common, commonly understood and, and kind of commonly talked about attack vector. So after the first attack I talked about last year, this is a quote from Stephen Schmidt, the CISO at AWS, uh, my former dotted line boss. He said, even if a customer misconfigures a resource, if the customer properly implements a least privileged policy, there is relatively little an actor has access to once they are authenticated, significantly diminishing the customer's risk. So what this quote is saying is, you need to have defense in depth. Defense in depth means not only having the configuration protection, but also the identity and access management protection in the form of continuously enforcing and uh, implementing least privileged policies. So the idea is even if my even if my firewall is misconfigured, even if that part of the of the defense in depth model is compromised, I still have that least privileged policy as the last line of defense. We all understand this. I don't think this is controversial. I think every customer I talk to says, "Yep." Yeah, We'd love to get there, um, but there is a challenge with the way permissions engineering happens today in most organizations. And so at this point, Charlene, I'm gonna talk quickly about what this slide means, and then I'm gonna ask you to open up the poll question once I've quickly gone through this. But you bet. let me just take you through this, uh, take you through this um, diagram real quick. The way most of the customers, in fact, the way all of the customers I've worked with, whether it's at CloudNox, at AWS, or at Google Cloud, have been doing permissions management is they've got someone here within the organization who's responsible for being the IAM admin. This could be someone on a central security team. This could be someone who is a decentralized policy admin. Maybe they're an application owner who has IAM admin access in an AWS account or a GCP project or an Azure subscription. But this person is basically responsible for determining what policies or what roles get assigned to which identities and which users in the environment. So the typical way policies get created is it's a back and forth and a bit of a negotiation between the developers, the development teams, and the IAM admins. So it's usually the developer comes in and says, I need these permissions. And then the admin says something like, okay, well, I don't think you need all of those permissions. I'm gonna give you these, or I can give you these in accordance with our policy. And it's a bit of a back and forth, a bit of a negotiation, maybe in a semi-automated process in some, in some ways. Uh, maybe there's some baseline rules that are just kind of one size fits all for the org. But what ends up happening is you get one of these two models. So on the one side of the house, you get lockdown. So this is where this team is really, really, really stingy about the permissions they hand out in the environment. So you'll get a super secure environment, but it'll be super slow. Uh, any policy changes will take days to weeks of change management requests. Testing will be really slow because if you hit an IM or identity and access block, you have to go back and open a new ticket open a new change request, maybe attend another meeting. So this will be secure at the expense of innovation. And what will end up happening here is you'll get a prevalence of things like shadow IT. You'll get developers kind of working around the security controls, doing things outside of the controls of the organization. So this isn't ideal for a lot of reasons. And a lot of organizations don't want that because what the, one of the value drivers of going to cloud in the first place is getting that increased pace of innovation by moving developers closer to the technology. So the other side of this model is what we call just-in-case permissioning. And just-in-case permissioning is where it's really fast, but the reason it's really fast is because this IAM admin team, in the name of limiting friction, in the name of making developers faster, in the name of you know, cutting down on tickets, they will grant broad access here uh, in the hopes and basically in the assumption that the developer will use that access responsibly, will use only what they need, and will never 
be in a situation where those credentials get compromised somehow. And so they might grant things like power user access in AWS or a contributor role in Azure or a project editor in Google Cloud um, because they want the developers to move quickly and this will enable them to move quickly um, and this will allow them to still innovate on behalf of the business. So from what I've seen, this model tends to be more common than this model, but it introduces a challenge that I'm gonna talk about in a moment after Charlene opens our next polling question. So go ahead, Charlene. All right, great. Polling question is going out right now. The question is, which cloud permissions management strategy does your organization align with? The, the answers, uh, response choices are lockdown, which is limited access, high barrier for developers to gain access, just in case, which is broad access, fast but insecure, or we haven't really gotten this far yet. So it, once again, the polling question is in the polling uh, tab on your interface. You can go ahead and make your choice. And uh, Nicholas, again, I'll leave the polling question open for a little bit, and then we'll circle back on the on the uh, the results. Awesome. Thank you very much, Charlene. So we'll leave that. We'll let that run for uh, a couple of minutes. So specifically on the point of just in case, I'm really interested to see what the audience says. In my experience, most of the customers I work with fall within this model because this is just way too restrictive for the organization to get any benefits out of cloud. Uh, but in this model, there's one really particular symptom that we see come out, which is called the permissions gap. And the permissions gap is exactly what it sounds like. It's that delta between permissions granted and permissions used in an environment. So what will happen is you'll grant broad access to a developer just in case. Um, they might come back and request more permissions on top of that, whether that's on a temporary or on a permanent basis. The gap will grow over time as more identities are added to the environment, as more of them get this kind of just-in-case access applied to them. And what we see when we engage with customers and we first uh, set up CloudNox in their environment and first look at the data is less than 2% of the permissions granted are typically used. And that's true of AWS. It's true of Google Cloud, it's true of Azure. We even support VMware and we see the same thing in VMware environments. So this is practically a proverb uh, that we see when we go in and we look at customer environments. So the permissions gap is a tactical problem. And going back to the CIEM space, the cloud infrastructure entitlement management space um, that we operate in, this is what Gartner calls the space of cloud knocks and tools like us. So there's a couple of things you want to solve. You want to get visibility into the permissions gap. You want to see where am I over permissioned? How many extra permissions am I granting? And you want to be able to see it so that you can right size and remediate those policies. So you can take those unused permissions away. So you can do that and you can stop there. And if you stop there, all that's going to happen is you're going to get this again in three months or six months. And the reason for that is because this underlying model hasn't changed. So until this model changes, until there's controls in place that enable organizations to automate a lot of this work and move in a direction where they can provide the speed to developers without making the compromise on the security side and not have to make this trade-off, this is going to continue happening. So the third piece is you need to have a CIEM platform that provides tools and that provides an API and that provides extensibility to be able to drive process change within the organization. And what I'm gonna do with the second part of, of this presentation is I'm gonna demo three specific use cases that CloudNox's customers are using to drive that process change and the value it's delivering for their businesses. So this isn't gonna be a general demo of CloudNox. Um, we have a couple of those on YouTube where you can see just the visibility, the ability to do remediation, policy generation, uh, single click remediation from within the console. This is going to be a bit more, how can I leverage this platform to drive that change? And what is ultimately the direction that we're helping our customers skate towards once they get past the tactical issue of correcting the permissions gap? So I'm gonna pause there, Charlene, if you wanna close our second poll, and let's just see what came back from the audience, please. Yep, yep, sure, the poll is now closed. The question was, which cloud permissions management strategy does your organization align with? Uh, the majority, 53% said lockdown. And then 33% said just in case. And then 13% said that they haven't really gotten this far yet. So 
Uh, I don't know if that aligns with what uh, what you're seeing in the market space, but that actually really kind of surprises me uh, that lockdown uh, is is the most, um, you know, more than half of folks said that their organization utilizes that strategy. So one thing with this question is, it, I guess it depends which lens you're looking at it from. So uh, if you're a developer and you've ever run into a situation where you've hit an issue with IM access, and you've had to go through and jump open tickets and jump through hoops to gain that access, that feels like lockdown. Um, whether or not the permissions gap is actually there, the permissions gap just means you have high risk permissions that you're not using. Um, likewise, the just in case side, if you're getting things like power user access or contributor or project editor, and those are common practices in your org, then you're probably on the, the just in case side. Either way, neither approach is really conducive to getting to that goal of least privilege access in the cloud at scale. And so that's where we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the use cases for Cloud Knox uh, in the environment where you can leverage this tool to drive some of that process change. So like I said, I, I framed it earlier. So Cloud Knox at, at its core is a tool that lets you pull in data from the cloud environment, visualize the permissions gaps, so basically see for all of the identities and all of the accounts, all of the projects, all of the subscriptions, what is the level of unused high-risk permissions that are granted in the environment? And we give you controls to generate policies and take those unused permissions away from identities. So basically, if I've got an AWS IAM role that has power user, and I can see in CloudNox it's only using 1% of those permissions against 1% of its accessible resources. Well, with CloudNox, I can generate a policy that only grants those used permissions and those access resources and takes everything else away. And then I can basically remediate that identity and say, this is your new policy, taking the old policy away. Because I'm not taking anything away that's actively being used, I'm not causing any friction for the underlying identity or the developer that's using that identity, but I'm still removing that unused permissions risk from the environment and reducing that risk by getting closer to that least privileged model. And then the second side of the tool is taking permissions away you know, that's that's part of it. But I also need to give developers a mechanism to quickly request new permissions on an as needed basis. So that's a second use case I'm gonna talk about shortly. But the first one I wanna talk about is that access control decision and how that happens in an environment. So if you're out there and you're a developer or if you're on the cloud team and you work with any of your developers, your, your app dev teams, your DevOps teams, you're probably familiar with this kind of deployment architecture where a team will build an application in staging They'll push, the, they'll create their templates, their infrastructure's code, their source code, they'll push that to a repository. That will trigger a deployment into a non-production, a staging account, UAT, some non-production stage. And then it'll go through your automated tests, your automated validations. And then once that all passes, it'll end up in production. This is commonly thought of as DevSecOps, uh, which is basically integrating these security tools and security checkpoints with the deployment process so you don't have security serving as kind of a, a one-off gate at the end of the process saying, nope, back to start. In this manner, you can build your security tests in at every stage of the life cycle so that you're running those tests automatically as your application moves through the stages. Now, that's great for configuration management. That's great for things like making sure you're not provisioning an instance that has an overly permissive security group or a Lambda function that uses libraries that are insecure or not whitelisted by the org, but, the developer is still gonna need access control. So in the dev, dev account, they'll usually have pretty broad access because this is a sandbox. It's isolated from the rest of the environment. It's not connected to the prod network or the non-prod network in any way. So I might give my developer users here power user to say, hey, this is your experimentation zone. You can build your app, you can experiment here, you can play around with things. Once I go to prod, I wanna limit their access to just the application. So there's some kind of access decision that has to happen and today, that happens out of band of this automated DevSecOps process. That's the negotiation between the IAM admin and the developers. And then once you go to production, you typically have read only. And if you need to escalate your permissions, you have a mechanism for doing that. If you get paged, if you have to fix an issue in prod, I'll talk about that piece shortly. But right now we're just gonna talk about what if we can automate this access decision? So what if instead of this having to be a negotiation between the IAM admin and the developers, what if we could automate this using a data-driven approach driven by CloudNox's API? So that's actually the demo I built for you here. So one of the neat things about CloudNox is our extensible API. And there's two, there's one API in particular 
which is really neat, which is the least privilege API. So basically by passing an identifier of an identity, such as an AWS ARN or uh, Amazon resource name to the CloudNox least privilege API, I can say, hey, CloudNox, here's an ARN for this role in the dev account. Give me a least privilege policy for this role based on its activity in this account. And CloudNox will give me back the, the JSON policy document uh, that I can then use uh, to create an equivalent policy and equivalent identity in my staging non-prod environment, and then ultimately in my production environment. And I can do this for any cloud platform that we support. So I can do this for GCP, I can do this for Azure. Um, I'm showing you the demo with AWS, just because that's what I built it in. Um, but this is a reference pattern that can be applied to any cloud provider. So the way this works, I'm gonna show you this demo in detail, but I've got a recorder. It's just a Lambda function that's listening to CloudTrail. It could be a serverless function in Azure or GCP that's listening to Cloud Audit Logs or Microsoft Graph, respectively. And it's basically recording every time an identity is created in this account or in this project or this subscription. Once that identity gets created, it gets logged in a central database. For me, I just have a simple DynamoDB table. And then when I'm creating my uh, when I'm creating my uh, staging application, when I push my code to staging, I have a script that runs that basically checks this database for all of the identities that were created in the counterpart dev sandbox for this app. And then it's gonna go through and create the counterpart identities in staging, create the least privileged policy based on the activity here, and then basically provision those identities automatically. So I'm gonna show you uh, what this looks like in my, uh, in my demo environment. Sorry, I just have an issue with my, uh, my browser hanging here. There it is. So here's my demo environment. And I've got three different AWS sessions open. I do wanna call out, this is a demo I built with a partner of ours uh, called Set Solutions. They are a, a cybersecurity consulting firm based in Houston, Texas. I work with uh, their really great chief security architect. Her name is Janice Russell. Hi, Janice, if you're watching this, but I wanna give them a shout out because we worked together on this demo and it's, it's been really compelling for customers so far. So um, what I've got here is I've got my central kind of tools or shared services account, and I've got my pipeline where I commit my source for my application, and then I can deploy that. Uh, it goes through stages where it deploys the staging, there's an approval, and then once I approve it, it'll deploy to prod. In my dev account, I've got my kind of sample app that I've built, just a simple product catalog, and I've got my recorder function, which is just listening to CloudTrail and recording those identities that are created in my central database. Uh, in my case here, that database is being recorded uh, in my tools account. And if I look and see what the DynamoDB table looks like, it's just recording my, uh, it's just recording the identities that I create here. So it's recording my ARN for my developer user that I've created in dev. So this is a user that exists in dev. And if I look at them in dev, um, first I'll show you, this is the staging account. They do not exist in staging. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start my pipeline it's gonna take a minute or two to just execute. And this pipeline is gonna deploy my app into staging and also create my counterpart users in staging. So I will uh, do a release change here, start the pipeline, and uh, I will show you what this user looks like in dev. So this is a dev sandbox. So over here, I've got my developer user and they've got their, uh, you know, their user groups, sorry, they've got my users here and I can see I've got my developer user in this account and I'll show you the permissions they have. It's pretty broad. I wanted them to be able to experiment to move quickly in this environment. So I gave them power user access and I gave them IAM full access in the environment. So they could create any identities they had to. Now, you probably wouldn't give them this level of access in the environment. You probably have your own service control policies. This will be whatever broad level of access you're comfortable giving out in a sandbox. So. Uh, in the meantime, what's happening with my pipeline is as it's running through, um, the pipeline is executing my build my build steps. Um, so I'm using AWS code build here. This could easily be uh, a Jenkins pipeline. It could be whatever other kind of build job you wanna use. But this is going to go through and execute my, uh, my right sizer script, my script that basically goes out and gets my least privilege policy from dev and executes it in staging. Uh, and then it's going to take that uh, and deploy it into the staging environment. Uh, and then after that, it's going to deploy my serverless YAML file, which is going to be used to just um, uh, build my actual application. So I can show you here, 
I'm actually getting the access token, I'm creating the roles uh, in staging, I'm getting that least privilege policy. What I'm left with is if I give this a refresh, well, now I'm in the staging account. This is my staging account ID. This is my dev account. So now in the staging account, I have this developer user. Well, what policy do they have? So they don't have power user access. They have this right size CK activity policy. And if I look at what actions have been granted, um, they have only the actions that have been granted. So I, I did a little bit of work with, uh, with DynamoDB, did a little bit of work with Lambda, I uh, did some work with CloudTrail and CloudWatch to create the log stream. And this is what the JSON looks like. It's just automatically generated this right size JSON and gone through and applied this uh, to this role. So what I'm left with here in this demo is I've granted just the right amount of access to this developer and their application. I've done it in a completely zero touch manner. I haven't had to do any kind of work with, uh, with you know a back and forth, a ticket creation. The policy creation is taken out of the hands of the developer. It's completely transparent to them. So when they get to staging, they have all the access they need and nothing more based objectively on the access they've used in this dev sandbox. And then what happens is when I'm ready to push to prod, I don't actually create a counterpart user in prod because typically access here is just gained through read only. So I might assume a read only role that has the appropriate policy, but I would still create the detached policy here that I can still use to escalate my privileges with CloudNox's privilege on demand functionality, which I'm gonna talk about next. So I'm actually gonna pause here. I'm just gonna see Charlene, are there any questions around this? Um, I'm gonna see if there's any questions related to the demo. It doesn't look like we have any. So if you think about any questions related to the demo here, you can throw them in, I can answer them. I see some general questions coming in uh, and I'm going to answer those at the Q and A window at the end. So keep the right. questions coming in, I like what I'm seeing. Uh, and, and we'll get to them shortly, okay? All right, so let's talk about that privilege escalation use case. So I mentioned here, um, we're creating that, that kind of detached uh, fine grain policy that we got from the activity and staging in dev. And we're gonna put that in prod and that's gonna be our privilege escalation mechanism. And let's talk about what that looks like with CloudNox. So with CloudNox, we have functionality that's called um, privilege on demand. I'm actually going to show you what it looks like in CloudNox itself. So I'm just going to pause my screen share for a second. And I'm going to log into my CloudNox environment and I'll bring it up and kind of show you exactly what I'm talking about firsthand. All right, I'll restart my screen share. Okay, so this is CloudNox and specifically where I'm going here is the JEP controller, which stands for just enough, pri just enough privileges. And the JEP controller is where I can do some right sizing from here, policy generation. And I can also do least privilege policy, uh, sorry, I can also do permissions on demand. So the typical paradigm here today, if I need to escalate permissions in prod is something like this, where a developer gets paged and they need to get in and you know fix something in the prod environment. Well. That's fine. I mean, one thing that happens there is usually they have to go out to something like a, a cyber arc or a psychotic secret store or some kind of uh, kind of credential vault where they'll go and request a broad role or a broad identity that is maintained just for that kind of uh, privilege escalation purpose. So I might be a developer with read only access to the environment, but if for some reason that read only access uh, falters or, or so that read only access is not enough, I would go out to uh, CyberArk and say, hey, you know, give me my admin credential, give me my power user access. And I apologize, it looks like my screen share, my Google, uh, my Google slides have kind of crashed on me. So I'll just open up a, uh, I'll just open up a slide deck in a PDF and pull that up here. Uh, but basically uh, what happens is I go out to my CyberArk, let's say, and I say, give me admin, give me an admin role for two hours. Now that'll give me the access I need to do the job but the challenge with that is that doesn't really jive with least privilege because in that situation, um, what ends up happening is I have a role that is way over permissive for what I'm actually trying to do in the environment. So instead what I'd like to do, and I apologize, I'm just having some issues with my browser uh, crashing on me there. So I'm just gonna open a new tab quickly um, and let me go back to CloudNox and bring it back over to my screen here. 
I can see everyone can still see this. So instead of me wanting to go in and request that broad role with that broad permission, and instead of me having to maintain that broad role in my environment, what if I could do fine grained privilege escalation by attaching ephemeral permissions to my existing role? So in AWS, I'd come into CloudNox and I could choose my account and I could say, you know, I'm Nicholas Beretta, this is my SAML user. And in AWS, I use this SAML user to assume this role, this 2E demo prod read only. And I want to attach a specific policy. So I've created that uh, activity policy as part of my pipeline in use case one. So what I could do is I could just choose, let's assume for example, this was that policy I created. I could actually go in and request just that policy on a time bound basis. Say, hey, I need this application, prod application A policy for four hours. I can give it a justification. You know, I need this to uh, fix something with the app. And what it'll do is, I'm not gonna submit it because I'll have to put in a, a one-time password, but once that gets approved, our controller will actually go out and automatically grant those permissions and then revoke them when the scheduled window is closed. And I can now escalate permissions on a fine-grained basis without me having to go get that admin credential or that power user credential. So I'm still getting the access I need to do my job and I can set thresholds, I can set auto approvals, I can integrate this request flow with an ITSM. So for example, we have a pre-built integration with ServiceNow where you can integrate this entire flow, including the auto approval rules with that tool. Um, but I can basically get the requests I need quickly, uh, get the permissions I need quickly, run the change, uh, and then come back to it and uh, lose those permissions without having to do anything else, without having to get that broad role that is maintained in the environment. So that is something that our customers find pretty powerful because now they don't have to maintain broad break glass credentials. They can do privilege escalation at the permissions level, at the existing identity level, and still give the same level of access while being congruent with zero trust and least privilege. So that's something that our customers call out. Privilege on demand is a, is a feature that's, that's unique to CloudNox in the CIEM space. And so it's really unique and drives that value for our customers. Um, it's something I wanted to call out for you here today. All right, so I'll quickly check and see if there's any questions specific to the demo. Uh, I'm just taking a peek at the Q&A tab. Um, I don't know if I see any, I'm looking at the chat as well. Yeah, we'll come doesn't yeah. look like we have any uh, related to the to the demo itself, but uh, if if we do, then I'll, I'll, I'll come on and I'll alert you, how's that? Awesome. That's fine. I actually have two slides left anyway, and then okay. we'll have the rest of the time for discussion. Perfect. So the last use case is a bit around continuous right sizing. So um, you might say, yeah, okay, you can right size through the console. And this use case is more for customers where they're starting out with CloudNox. Maybe they already have their permissions gap in their environment and they want to remediate it at scale. So let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. Maybe I can full screen it. So you might say with the, uh, you know, with the permissions gap, I can go into the console and I can right size it and I can do that. But you now I've got hundreds of accounts or thousands of projects and I've got hundreds of identities and I don't want to click through and remediate all of them. So again, this is where our API can come in. This is a reference pattern that we built with AWS using AWS config. And we actually put this on the AWS blog, but um, you could apply this pattern to equivalent services on Google Cloud or Azure as well. And basically we have an API. So for every identity in your environment, we calculate a risk score. We call that risk score the privilege creep index. It goes from one to a hundred. Basically the closer to a hundred it is, the higher the level of unused high risk permissions that identity has. So if you have a risk score of a hundred, that means your identity has like admin access and it's not using any of it. It's using less than 1% of it. So with our API, we can make a call out and say, hey, for every identity, give me the privilege creep score for that identity. And then we can say any identity above a certain threshold, above 50, let's say, let's programmatically remediate it. So let's trigger, in this case, a Lambda function to fetch that least privilege policy from the CloudNox API, just like we did in use case one with the pipeline, apply it to the identity and programmatically remove the existing permissions or the existing policies. And what that does is it leaves me with a right size policy, but it basically does it as a guardrail approach where I'm doing continuous right sizing of the environment because privilege creep can change. Just because you're right size today doesn't mean you're right size 90 days from now. You might stop using certain permissions or no longer need certain permissions. So this mechanism will ensure that 
as permission usage decreases, you're removing those unused permissions on a continuous basis. So these are three example use cases around deployment, around initial access control, around remediation, and around privilege escalation that illustrate how customers are using CloudNox um, and the features that it provides and the API that it provides to fundamentally change that core permissions model away from the assumptions, assumptions driven process of either complete lockdown or just in case or somewhere in between, getting to a model that is more data driven, that is adaptive, and that's in line with a DevSecOps approach to cloud configuration management and really fits nicely with that model. In order to get away from that model and to get there, the platform needs to provide not only visibility, not only the ability to generate policies within the console, those two things, quite frankly, are table stakes in the CIEM space but it needs to be able to do them programmatically with the API. It needs to support privilege on demand capabilities to do fine grained privilege escalation. Um, and it needs to be able to do this on a continuous ongoing basis um, with those integrations. So I wanted to illustrate how CloudNox does that for our customers today. We have 20 minutes left, plenty of time for some really good discussion and some really good questions, but I'm gonna stop with the slides here and Charlene, turn it over to you to maybe uh, tee up some of the questions from the audience. Absolutely, yes, we have gotten some great questions in, but there is plenty of time for question and answer. So if you do have a question for Nicholas, go ahead and use either the question and answer tab or the chat tab, and we will get right to it. First question here, uh, Sujit asks, other than lockdown and just in case, what are other privileges? And does types of privileges vary from different cloud services providers? I would say broadly, the two models that I see are some combination of either just in case or lockdown. Um, because when you think about it, um, there's not really any way to do fine grained permissions management in any of the cloud providers today, other than maybe uh, you know, leveraging some of the tools they offer. So AWS, GCP, Azure, they all, they all offer some mechanism of generating right size policies, but they happen after the fact. So they take in a baseline, they take in some you know, activity data for an identity, and they'll say, okay, this identity is only using these permissions, and they will generate the policy for you, but then you need a mechanism to apply that policy. Usually that process of applying the policy is manual or semi-automatic today. And so um, what I end up seeing with customers is usually they're not granting enough permissions, they're doing the lockdown, or they're doing two broad permissions, which is the just-in-case model. The ideal model is zero trust, least privilege, which is every identity has exactly what it needs, no more, no less. It's just really difficult to get there without a tool, without something like CloudNox that's in there, not only giving the visibility, but providing the controls to build those guardrails uh, and make that a core part of the environment in an automated fashion. All right. Great. Uh, uh, guys, plenty of time for questions. So please do not hesitate. If you've got one for Nicholas, go ahead and get it on in. Uh, here is another great question for you. We have Splunk. Are there other suggestions on how to use that to monitor these risks? Yeah, so one thing going back to the platform being extensible is it enables integrations with your existing tools. Um, it would be great if there was a, a point security tool out there update everything end to end. The reality is that's just, you know, that's just not what exists today. There are different tools that cover different layers of the defense in depth model. It's really important that they're all able to integrate with each other seamlessly. Um, and so CloudDocs with our API, we've built integration. So for example, we have a pre-built integration with Splunk, where we expose the data we collect, some of the alerts that customers set in our platform, we integrate those with Splunk's common information model. And we're also working on driving that integration further to build some of the remediation controls and the action controls into Splunk as well. But we also have a permissions analytics API that enables those same integrations with any other SIM type tool that you'd have in your environment. Or maybe you wanna liberate the data from CloudNox into your downstream data lake or something like that. So that's all supported through the API today. Excellent. All right. Okay, we have one more question here. Um, so uh, one more time, if you guys have a question, please go ahead and get it on in. Um, okay, here's the question. Does this integrate with ITSM, serv IT service management? We have service now. Yep, absolutely. So 
this does integrate with ServiceNow, specifically the permissions on demand flow that I showed will integrate with ServiceNow. It's just a, a ready click deploy integration with the ServiceNow app catalog. So basically you can integrate that entire flow with your existing uh, ITSM. If you're not using ServiceNow, um, we have an API for privilege on demand. So you could integrate with any other type of tool. I've got some customers building integrations with Jira, one customer who's building an integration with the Slack bot that they have. Um, and we are also on our side prioritizing other integrations based on what our customers are asking for. We built the ServiceNow integration because it was the most common ask. Um, but yes, you can integrate this with any ITSM you'd have in your environment. Okay. All right, great. Well, that is all the questions that we have right now, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave the question and answer tab open to see if we get any other questions in. And while we're waiting to see, uh, just a quick reminder to the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, or if you just wanna watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website. So you can go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section, section and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, okay, still no new uh, questions that have come in. So let's uh, let's go ahead and do the drawing for the four twenty-five dollars Amazon gift cards. And then if we have any other questions that have come in, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and address those. Our uh, gift card winners today, first one is Rose N. Congratulations, Rose. Our second one, second winner today is uh, Carolyn C. Congratulations, Carolyn. Our third winner today is Andrew H. Congratulations, Andrew. And our fourth and final winner today is Jamie D. Congratulations, Jamie. We'll be following up with all four of you offline by email to get your uh, gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam folder. All right, Nicholas, I think your uh, presentation was so comprehensive that there are no more questions from the audience. But I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. Um, and if you do have a question uh, as we are wrapping up and you want to go ahead and put it on into the, the queue, um, please do so. If we don't get to it during the webinar, you know, if, if it just goes that much too late, then please know that, uh, that, that Nicholas will be getting a copy of all the questions and either he or somebody from Cloud Knox will be able to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Absolutely. Um, and, um, I'll just say as well, there's my contact info on the screen. So on LinkedIn, if you want a copy, we'll get you a copy of the slides if you want them. If you have any questions you want to follow up offline, I will get that list of questions, but also happy to have a chat offline with any questions you have. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, it was a pleasure to get to speak to you today. And, and you know, like I said, I'm looking forward to having a chance to talk to you and work with you in the future um, if we have that opportunity. All right, great. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, you know, your your expertise is always appreciated. It was a great presentation, and I I love the the use cases and and the uh, the demos uh, attached to them. So good stuff all the way around. Um, so thank you again for your time and your expertise. I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. Um, as always, uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay.